What I wanted to talk to you today is about uh, some of the practices that we've done at Bentley Secondary College and I guess to, to do that properly I need to uh, initiate for you my thoughts and whether the journey came for me and a long, long time ago uh, I used to think the world was a big place, like a really big place. Uh, travelling to Europe or, or America or, or um, England was something that you sort of dreamed about and it wasn't quite the era of boats but you could still go by boat but it was a big, big place. But then I read an article, and it must have been a science teacher of some sort that, that pointed it out to me, that said, look at this about DDT. We were using DDT in Australia, it was washing into our waterways, and it was ending up in the shells of penguins down the Antarctic. And the penguin shells were getting thinner, and as a result, when the eggs were being laid, they were getting hairline cracks, and the, the chicks were freezing before they could develop. So at that point, I all of a sudden started to think, well, maybe this world is shrinking a little bit. More recently, we've had the experience of Fukushima. I was fortunate to uh, entertain 20 students from Fukushima whose um, lifestyle had been dramatically changed by, by uh, the activities that they could do in and around their local area. But then I read another article just recently about a 450 kilo blue fin tuna. Now they're a big fish, a seriously big fish, and a fish that normally sheds radiation. They don't uh, necessarily accumulate it. But it was caught off the coast of America 10,000 kilometres from Fukushima and had more than 10 times the normal level of radiation in its background. And all of a sudden you have a really, really small world. And, and for um, uh, us, the importance that we need to do is to educate our children to, to cope with this ever-shrinking world, but we can't expect them to save the planet unless we teach them to love it first. And so most of the projects and stuff that we do at Bentley Secondary College are about that. And I just want to run you through a few of those. I'm an owner operator of, of three children myself and um, <laughs> They, they actually say that they own and operate me, you know, they poke you in the chest, the wallet comes out, it's like an ATM machine, but they, they, uh, I really wanted a better world for them and I guess very selfishly again, uh, my potential grandchildren. They haven't produced yet but I'm still uh, uh, ever hopeful. So I'm going to talk you through a couple of these projects and the first of these is the Mirabun wetland. Mirabun is the, um, the Bunurong word for a land of plenty and it's often translated to mean mother's milk. So it was an area where the Bunurong people used to come and they'd camp for a long period of time and we got the rights to use that name by connecting with our indigenous uh, traditional owners. So this was the space that we had out at, at the uh, back of the college. We were doing a new learning centre uh, and we had this area of asphalt and concrete that was horrible. And with a bit of creativity we thought how can we go about uh, capitalising on this space and I approached the Urban Stormwater Authority, they don't exist anymore but uh, at, at the time they did, and we said if we can create a better discharge of stormwater for our site, will you come on board and help us? And after some negotiation and, and uh, what have you, we reached a, a memorandum of understanding and they said they would give us $75,000. I almost fell off my chair. And they said, but you've got to put $75,000 in yourself. And again, we thought, we've got this huge, massive building going on, we've got to be able to play some funny money stuff in here somewhere. Uh, so we agreed wholeheartedly that we would do that. And so we set about building a, um, the Mirabun wetland. They gave us uh, their money in dribs and drabs, and the, the first of that, uh, that picture there cost me $20,000. Um, we had to carve out of flat asphalt and concrete a water course that would flow like a normal wetland. We had to create the hydrology that would allow this space to fill up after a rain event and drain down to a resting level over 72 hours. And it took a fair bit of work. I didn't want to have to put a fence around the whole thing um, because uh, uh, I wanted kids to be able to access it on a regular basis without having to go through gateways and all that sort of stuff. So we had to alter the slope so that we could, you know, that, that running hazard when kids run, they, they can't stop going down the hills and, and what have you. So um, uh, we, we redesigned this whole thing. And this took a, a, a lot of money. Now the sale, uh, sorry, just uh, flicking back one shot. This building that was being created in the background there, that was funded from the snail, uh, snail, the sale of the Snowy River Scheme. And as we know, that fell through. Now we had the line in Parliament for this building, but it meant that we dropped into another financial year. The Urban Stormwater Authority did not have the capacity to encompass more than a couple of financial years. And so just after I'd spent their 20, we hadn't spent a crack of our own money yet, they came to me and said, look, I'm sorry, the money's run out, you've, you've fallen outside your memorandum of uh, understanding. Um, We'll, we'll have to stop the funding. And that was the first time in my life I became a professional liar. Um, <laughs> we had some earthworks going on. I'm the photography teacher at school as well. We had some earthworks going on. I photographed all of those. 
And the Moorabbin Hospital were actually building as well at that time. So I went over there and I photographed a fair <laughs> bit of their stuff and took the photographs in a way that you couldn't tell where they were taken from. You know, it was a, a bobcat here, a drain here, a pipe there and all that sort of stuff. And then three days before Christmas, went in to the Urban Stormwater Authority. Laid out 30 A3 photographs, nicely laminated, nice bright colours. And I so said, you can't do this to us. You know, look at what's going on. I didn't say which were the actual ones that were going on, I just showed them a range of pictures. And I said, if you stop that now, we're going to have the mother of all occupational health and safety issues for the start of next year. And it took a day, and they finally agreed to stretch it into one additional financial year. I'd been in contact with our bills, and I said, no worries, we're going to work through January, it'll be ready for you. And they did, they were fantastic. They came in and uh, we actually started to uh, construct this facility. And it's a facility that actually uh, drains and treats six million litres of water a year. Absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we wanted to not only improve the uh, quality of the water that we were discharging, but we also wanted to improve the uh, biodiversity and the habitat that we had there. And we thought, well, we can also make this an outdoor classroom. We can do a whole bunch of stuff with this. So as it was being developed and going on, we were taking in ideas from all over the place of how we could actually improve this even further. The, um, the outdoor classroom uh, component was good. We didn't, uh, we're on six and a half hectares, so we've got a fantastic amount of space. Uh, kids don't need to go out to this space to kick a ball and eat their lunch. So if, if they did that, it would cease to be habitat. And we really made that message clear that this was a special place. It was an outdoor classroom and any teacher could take any group of kids out there at any time to do anything, but not take them out there to play. Uh, it had to be a learning space. So we had art going on out in the um, uh, room there. They made, uh, sorry, out in the uh, wetland there. They made sculptures and uh, put those up and uh, they deteriorated over time and were replaced as well. The, um, other programs that were going on, we started to get other teachers interested and in, engaged. And they said, can you come and teach us about this sort of stuff? And I said, no, couldn't do it, not possible. But I've got a bunch of kids that can do it for you. And so teachers came in and our kids taught the teachers. And that was a really confronting thing for quite a few teachers. We taught to them, uh, the kids taught them about environmental monitoring, about uh, being part of the SWEP program or being part of the Resource Smart program, any one of the number of other programs they came in and we ran PDs for teachers. And it was fantastic, but boy did it empower those kids. And so much so that when we managed to get some serious politicians in, these kids were absolutely fearless. Far more, um, uh, you know, uh, stronger at, at dealing with the police than, than I ever was. We also thought when this water was coming out, the six million litres, where was it going? It was going out into the bay and it was all nice and that was all great. But we thought maybe we can do something a little bit better with it first before we discharged it. And we decided to irrigate one of our, our playing fields. We applied for successfully a uh, community water grant, got $50,000 and chopped up our, our soccer playing field and laid a series of pipes underneath that um, actually distribute water sideways. It goes through a geotextile fabric. And that means that uh, we can pulse that water through on 15 minute intervals and it waters uh, deep down, the roots grow deeper, the grass is stronger and it's a soft plane surface for kids. This was a, again, I, I talk about being selfish and I am, the, the, the impetus for this came again from a, a personal experience. One of those three owner operators that I've got there is named Ben and at the age of 16 years of age he was a cricket nut. Um, now, Cricket to me is like watching grass grow, I'd rather watch grass grow. But watching your own kids play sport is, is fantastic, I can't recommend that enough. But Ben was an unusual kid because he could run just as fast backwards as forwards. And we're out playing at Hayes Paddock and someone skied a ball, it's gone flying, arcing through the air and Ben's taken off. Knees up under his chin, Dad's heart's pounding, that's my boy, that's my boy. He launched himself like a banana backwards and pulled this catch out of the air that was unbelievable. The crowd were on their feet. Ben pulled it into his chest and he hit the ground and went smack like that and didn't get up. And he had acquired a brain injury from playing on the ground that was just too hard at Hayes Paddock. We spent three days in a neurosurgery unit and it probably took me six months before we got him back. Uh, and by, when I say got him back, he's now uh, made 100% recovery, but he was aggressive, he was obnoxious to live with, he had amnesia, uh, he had all sorts of problems during that recovery time. And that's what we were sending our kids out to play on every day. They talk about uh, necessity of being the mother of invention. The, um, he's now a very successful engineer and earning more money than his dad. The, um, so that was our subsurface irrigation system. That's the geotextile fabric that we run it through and as I say, it pulses out sideways. We got complaints from our neighbours. They said Bentley Secondary College is stealing water during the drought. We had the only green patch of grass in Bentley. And uh, it was only because we weren't losing topical evaporation. It was quite fantastic. So the drought had been very hot, we had a, um, uh, you get pretty good at uh, getting the best for your school as we do for our kids and uh, I'd negotiated a fairly 
uh, strong contract for the life of the plants that we wanted to put in here. And uh, I realised if I exercised that, uh, that right, and um, I'm thinking empathy here, we had our, our, uh, our nursery people had supplied us uh, thousands and thousands of plants, but the drought was killing them. We just couldn't keep them alive. There was no rain there for it. So again, we negotiated and we were empathetic to each other's needs and we decided if we ripped up all the plants that we'd stuck in, moved them into one of the water pools and then brought in Class A recycled water, we could keep them going through the drought as long as it took and then after the drought we'd use our community to replant them out again. Now they're still in business and I still buy plants from them and we've now got a fantastic wetland as well. So it was tough but when the rains came, uh, I'm a fly fisherman as well and I'm thinking I'm going to stock this with trout, this is going to be fantastic <laughs> after work, I'm going to be doing all this sort of stuff. But that wasn't to be the case. We also thought that the water when it came out of the wetland was going to be that much cleaner. That wasn't the case either. Uh, squadrons of up to 40 ducks or water, water, you know, and in they came. And down the, um, the lower photograph there at the top end, there's a ramp that we use uh, as a part of a classroom. Uh, they all roosted on that at night. They, they crapped into the water and it was even filthier at the other end than what it was. But once the plants grew up, it, uh, it got a lot better. So it started to grow. We redistributed the plants. The, uh, we had a number of working bees with our parents, so engaging with the community is enormously important. Uh, and they were very, very supportive and they came in on a regular basis and, and planted out this whole area as well. And it was great to see relationships of a different sort. Uh, this, this guy uh, is one of our dads and he said she never helped me in the garden at home but she's got a bit of a taste for it now. And uh, So different relationships were forming between uh, members of our community, it was fantastic. When we talk about the politicians, I, I spoke to Penny Wong um, uh, in Canberra and asked her to come down. I said, I've got a couple of really good kids that want to talk to you about sustainability. It took 11 months before she came and uh, I don't know what your politics are and it doesn't really matter, but she is a fairly fantastic operator at, at what she does. And uh, we sat down first, it wasn't a media event. And I said to her, look, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. And I, I was talking geothermal uh, units and things like that at that stage. I made the mistake of repeating myself once and she said, I've heard that, I don't need to hear it again. <laughs> Fine penny, you know, and so chat, chat, chat. Josh and Lauren had been primed up for what we wanted uh, to get from Penny and they repeated themselves numerous times throughout the day and I just kept getting this filthy look from Penny and shaking her. <laughs> but she was very, very nice to the kids. So uh, uh, she was going to take on board some geothermal uh, projects that we had in mind and um, uh, she said she'd talk again to us after she got back from Copenhagen but of course that was a... Uh, a bit of a disaster and that project uh, didn't go ahead. It's since surfaced as part of the Bio 21 building with um, uh, University High and uh, Melbourne Uni. Um, when the rain started to come, our plants started to grow. Some of the kids put this uh, presentation together, so uh, they like the expanding words and what have you. And that's pretty well the, the, the view from my, uh, my office window. I reckon I've got some of the best real estate in the school. That's uh, as it was two weeks ago. Uh, and as I say, six million litres goes through there. We've got frogs coming in now. We've got turtles that are actually uh, hatching eggs there as well. Uh, we've also got a fox that chases them around. I can't quite get rid of him. If I was in a country school, I might be able to shoot him, but uh, I, I can't down in Bentley. Um, but uh, as I say, we've got this is, uh, it's, it's almost indigenous. Not quite, but almost indigenous. Um, we had a few um, uh, plants that uh, work well in the wetland, but weren't indigenous to that area there, but we were happy to go with that. And the wildlife started to move in and that, that, that really started to move things for kids. We've had uh, families of ducks come in and, and, and successfully raise up to uh, 13 and 14 chicks uh, each year. Tim Holding was the minister responsible at the time for um, the Urban Stormwater Authority and my lies on Christmas Eve. And uh, he made a point of coming down to see that this had actually happened. And um, it was fantastic. This was about um, a fortnight after he got found on Mount Feathertop by our secret spy plane. I don't know whether you remember all of that, but uh, he came down to look at that. So that project was a, an ongoing project. We were never going to finish it right at that point. And uh, I have a, a fantastic woman at work called Dr. Intercetti, and she teaches mindfulness, mindfulness meditation to our kids. And she was complaining one day that I've got a classroom, I've got to pull the tables and chairs apart, I then do the activity with the kids, and then we've got to rebuild the classroom again. And it undo does a lot of the good work that happens. And I thought, well, I'm head of sustainability. This is personal sustainability. I need to look at this. And we decided that we would try and build a meditation centre that was dedicated purely to that. And we wanted to include some Indigenous uh, connections in there as well. So we named it our Meditation Indigenous Cultural Centre. At the time we started this, we had $400. And that was for a gazebo from Bunnings. We were going to actually stick that gazebo out there and run our classes out there on cushions and it was going to be great. And then I had a better idea. I was reminded of it as I was driving up yesterday. The, um, you know, the graveyard with all the old classrooms out near Kyneton? 
I thought I can buy one of those and transport that for about six to eight thousand dollars and get the kids to paint it all up and, and, and what have you and, and that would become our mindfulness meditation centre. And I was talking to my wife about it and uh, she said, you don't remember that first couch you came home with from Ikea, do you? And I said, no, no, it slipped my mind. It must have not been a very memorable couch. But as she told the story, I came home with this thing. It was red, uh, it was horrible, it was uncomfortable, it was cheap. Uh, and in our early life, she said, send it back. I'd rather sit on a fruit box and have something that's 10th rate. Now, this was never going to be 10th rate, but it was an important message. Why not shoot for the stars? What do you got to lose? The worst that can ever happen to you when you're going for broke for your kids or for your school is that someone might say no. Look for another person. So I approached one of the world's top 100 architectural firms and said, I want you to design a building for us. I want it to be a meditation centre and I also want it to be an indigenous cultural centre. And you could hear the hands rubbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, there is a small problem. They said, don't worry about this. We solve problems all the time. I spent an hour talking with the principal architect about the aims and, and what we hope to achieve with this. And then he said at the end of the conversation, what's the small problem? I said, I want you to do it for nothing. <laughs> and there was this massive pregnant pause. He said, from the last hour, he said, I don't think you're a stupid person, um, but you've got to have a good reason for asking for that. And I said, we would become your champion. In the traditional days of the Knights, we would be your champion. You come on board with this project and we will champion you every opportunity that we've got. DWP suitors, John Scout was the name of the architect. <laughs> the, the, um, the process only took him about 15 seconds to make up his mind. He said, we're in. He said, I'll give you a young architect. He's, he's fairly fresh, but he's got great ideas and he will work with you and take as long as you want, no charge. We still had $400. Um, <laughs> Nick designed this building. It was really quite fantastic. And um, I, I said I wanted to put in a billabong as well so that we could uh, marry that with our wetland and grow endangered uh, species of fish that were indigenous to the area there as well. Um, and he did a fantastic job, absolutely fantastic. I then went out and got quotes for his project and they were all within $10,000 of $330,000. He had $400. We then applied for, unsuccessfully, uh, a specialisation grant for sustainability from the state government. They had uh, 25 of those grants, $2.5 million, they were $100,000 each. But we did get one in the second round. So we now had $100,000 and $400. So that was enough to get us started. I'd been talking to my principal about building this thing for a long time and a long time. She's going, yeah, yeah, initially. Then I overheard her talking to another principal. We're going to have an, a meditation and Indigenous <laughs> cultural centre. And at that point you realise, yep, the money's come through. We're on the track. It's going to happen uh, because we, we, you know, we talked it up enough and our community was very, very uh, much behind us. At a working bee with our parents, one bloke said, I've got to make this a builder. I'll get him to give you a ring. I'm in the car, I'm driving down to Warrnambool to visit some of our kids on a leadership camp down there. And the phone goes, very slow speaking voice, it's Tim here. And I said, Tim, you're a builder. He said, yeah, but I normally build things sort of somewhere between 15 and 30 million dollars is what I do. I do hospitals and things like that. Uh, he said, what did you want to do? So I explained to him. And he said, oh, when did you want to do it? I said, oh, you know, last week, oh, I couldn't look at it till Thursday, said Tim. He arrived on Thursday with a surveyor and laid it out. Now, all of you are in education and all of you know that at some time, you will make a leap of faith. It might be with a kid or a parent or a project, but you make that leap of faith. You know it in your waters. And there's no evidence that says you should do it. In fact, all the evidence says you shouldn't, but you take that leap. And Tim was a leap of faith. I said, how much is this going to cost me, Tim? Don't worry about the cost, Bill, it'll be fine. I said, Tim, I'm playing with government money here. I, you know, I've got to be, don't worry about the cost, Bill, it'll be fine. So I made the leap of faith. Tim decided to do it for the cost of wages only. I had two builders that actually uh, built most of this. Um, uh, Mitchell and Andy, and they used to call themselves, hey, Mitch and Andy. And um, they came up with this. They built this. We did this in three months. We didn't have a plan in place at that stage. This took three months from bare dirt to this. Absolutely phenomenal. The cost eventually was $135,000. We had our $100 and $400, so we didn't have to find all that mo much more to fund this. And uh, when Tim buys his concrete, he buys it a million bucks at a time sort of thing. You know, he puts in the order. So he just rang Borel. G'day, mate. It's Tim. Need a hand. Need a favour. And he did that with the plaster and he did it with the timber and he did it with everything. And so we had a saving on this of $195,000. It's really quite phenomenal. It's a beautiful space, absolutely spectacular space. And in fact, as the kids walk in, you can see from the entrance door there, there's a, a bit of a bulkhead and it's like you go under the bulkhead and move into the space and they go quiet. 
They take their shoes off before they come inside. And they're dead quiet when they come in. They move into this meditation space absolutely uh, seamlessly and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Where are we going? So it's located right in the middle of this Murubin wetland. It's really quite, uh, as I say, phenomenal. We have uh, indigenous uh, fish in there now, uh, the Bidianus Bidianus, which is the silver perch. Uh, the early arrivals were the ducks, of course. They see spare water anywhere, they'll grab it. Um, this little girl belongs to um, our, our careers teacher and uh, her husband, who does work for us two days a week in the garden. And inside the bag, there were 100 of those um, uh, silver perch. They uh, came up the surface, there was plenty of tucker in there. We, we fed them initially, but now we don't feed them and um, they've done very well. That's our head of English and Dr Chetty on the other side there. They decided that they wanted to donate an island to the Billabong. So this is island time. Inside there is shade cloth and plastic bottles that the kids drank and, uh, and collected in there. And the idea was that we'd plant that out, the roots would grow through, give habitat for the fish to hide in and also help keep the algal problems down in any enclosed body of water. So they all turned up on a Saturday to not only build the island but launch it amid great fanfare. That's how it looked uh, when it first went in and uh, we've since got a couple of other islands since I've prepared this uh, starting to go in there as well now. Um, we did champion not only um, Tim Cantwell from Design Constructions and uh, Borel and everyone else uh, including the architects who, uh, who supported us and so much so that we got uh, a phone call, not a phone call, an email from uh, England saying that we'd been shortlisted for an International Green Award. And uh, which was quite phenomenal. Uh, Red Simons from ABC 774 uh, rang us and uh, said, would you do an interview on, on, on air? So I spoke to him on phone on air and told him what we were doing and why we wanted to do it and what was happening. And he let me name every single one of the people that supported that. So commercial organisations that supported us, he let us go. Um, the, whatever the one is in the morning with Fran Kelly, um, she also got on the air as well and we were able to repeat the same thing again. Tim and John and all these people sort of rang in to say, the phone's been ringing hot. Everyone wants to know about this project. And I said, champion, we've done it. And, and we will continue to do it. The, um, I said to Red at the end of the interview that if we do happen to get up on this thing, you'll have to come and do an outside broadcast. And uh, Red said, uh, that's entrapment. I said, do you, ever <laughs> do you ever listen to yourself on Radio Red? I said, that's what you do every day of your life. And he said, all right, all right, all right. Anyway, um, we'd been over in uh, London, we won the award, um, Red came out, I, I was looking at a project in Scotland so I didn't make it back for that but I, I spoke to him uh, by phone from, from Scotland and our kids played the jazz uh, interludes between the, the various segments of the show, this is the world's most sustainable jazz band. The scone that he got for morning tea, this is the world's most sustainable scone. He interviewed our architect, he interviewed our builder, all of this on air and as I say, it's priceless, you can't buy that sort of stuff. It was absolutely fantastic. And then we decided to uh, spread the... How, how am I going for time? What Time to wind up, I'm pointing out. Okay, I'm going I'm to finish there now. Um, we did create a forest as well. I'll scoot through the pictures very quickly for this, if I can do that. That was a space. That was a team. That's where we finished it after four hours. That was back in June 2011. And that's it today. So uh, again, these projects that engage with your community are fantastic. Um, we are expecting our kids to solve problems that you and I don't even know are problems yet. And they're going to have to do it using technology that probably hasn't been invented. Our role is to re resource our kids and show them that we believe in them and we have the faith in them to actually take the, the battle forward and create a more sustainable world. Thank you very much.